You have to unmute. There is no audio. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, but only since now. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'd like uh, to thank uh, Adam for this kind uh, introduction and all the organizers for the invitation uh, to give a talk. It's a great pleasure to talk to such young people, especially about such uh, bold ideas that I want to talk about. Uh, so the, the, the title is a little bit pretentious, but that's deliberate because I wanted to somehow uh, tell you a story which is mostly conjectural in the sense that uh, there is much more to do than has, has been done so far. Uh, maybe it will look that <clears throat> some of the things are tremendously complicated, but this is like playing uh, board games or computer games. So usually when you, when you buy a game, uh, for example, Civilization Through the Ages or Twilight Imperium, you just get a, a thick book of rules, which is maybe like uh, 20, 50, 60 pages. And you, of course, you don't know how to play the rules of the game, but then you read through the book and then you discover that at least you know how to navigate the game with your friends. You still don't know how to play the game. You play several times and you still find a lot of interesting things. I think that's exactly the point of this, of this talk today that I want you to introduce you uh, by some kind of categorical thinking that you were very nicely introduced in the talk of Professor Mastic into the realm where you'll be playing new games and these games will actually bear some fruits, in particular, lead to some scientific discoveries, uh, in particular, this kind of conjectural grand mathematical unification. But before we talk about the very uh, brave and bold ideas, uh, let's start with something that is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally important to this talk. Let's talk about natural numbers. So everyone knows what are natural numbers, even with instinct. These are just simply objects that somehow uh, quantify uh, some simple uh, cardinalities like one, two, three. We have some rules to build them. We know that if we add one, we get another integer and so on. So, so we can add them, we can multiply them. We know how to do it. Addition is basically easy, right? Addition is just adding ones. That's all it is. So it's not a very intrinsically interesting operation. It just represents some kind of a shift operator. And Multiplication is already quite surprising, right? Because you realize that just after a few experiments that not all integers, not all natural numbers are, are meant to be equal in the sense that there are fundamentally more important integers than the others. So for example, uh, one is the most important integer because if you multiply by one, you always get the same thing. So it's kind of identity model, right? Uh, then you have two, two is kind of a special number because the smallest number there is not decomposable and it's not one, okay? We, we call it a prime number. That's exactly the definition that, that we make here. So that this is, this is the uh, important property that I want to emphasize that if you have a number that you can factor into a product and always one of the factors is the number itself, then we call it a prime. Of course, we discard one for, for, for some strange reasons, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so, so we can somehow think that among integers, there are certain kind of atoms, which we call primes. And they are very fundamental because all the other, that's the, the again, it's kind of a pretentious name, a fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells you that essentially every positive integer is a product of primes, right? So we can build every, every integer from these primes. But they also have some kind of special uh, ability that the primes will be a kind of a litmus paper that will, that will somehow measure for us the fundamental geometry, the fundamental properties of other objects. And, and one of the very important results, early results about prime numbers is the stipulation that the set of primes is infinite. Well, actually at the time of Euclid, it wasn't clear what it actually means infinite, right? We know that Cantor established a proper, proper theory of infinities. So at the point of, of when the, this theorem was, was discovered, this was basically a statement saying that for any given set of, of primes, we can find another one, right? And we can indefinitely extend, extend the set. Then came Eratosthenes, and, and, and this guy was also very bright because he said, okay, look, so Euclid showed you how to find some primes. 
Now I'm giving you an algorithm, the Eratosthenes sieve, as we call it nowadays, which essentially allows you to generate all the primes effectively, right? Up to any, any, any bound. Well, and finally, in the, in the 19th century, the mathematicians uh, got enough tools to study the primes in a much more refined way. So Chebyshev, almost 50 years before Atamar and De La Vallée Poussin, essentially proved that the number, the, the, if you count how many primes are up to the bound X, it's roughly X over log X. And the main fight was just for the constant. So the constant was not clear whether the main term is uh, with constant one or it's slightly less than one or more, more than one. Actually for Chebyshev, uh, this was exactly the, 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 the kind of ambiguity that he had. And then it was closed by Adamart and De La Vallée Poussin that they actually showed that this was the main term. So that this log is natural logarithm, yes? Yes, the, the, well, actually, yes, the, that's exactly, yeah, that, that's a very good point because otherwise you have to change the constant. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so in this case, it's a, lo it's a natural logarithm. Okay, so, so the primes are really fundamental and they are not only fundamental for their own sake in the sense that we can study only the primes for the sake of understanding primes themselves. But as I said, the main point of this talk will be to show that the primes can be effectively used, for example, to study geometry. And that sounds a little bit strange because like how you can, you can study the geometry of the torus with prime numbers. And I'm, as I'm going to show you, by the, uh, by the devices which are basically coming from category theory, we can transport the properties of the torus into some other categories so from topology to, to algebra and then to arithmetic that allows you to detect the, the very fact of being a torus just with prime numbers. Okay, that's, that's a very strange, but very fruitful in the end idea. Okay, so the objects that I'm going to talk about today are usually called equations. And what are equations? Well, basically equations are like ways in which we match some objects, right? So there has to be some operations called equality or equivalence. And if we have like two objects on, on two sides of this equivalence, if we clash them together with this operator, we get an equation. And the equations I want to talk about today are basically the equations in which we are playing with the objects very familiar to you in the language of algebra. So we can add, we can multiply, uh, we can uh, take powers, uh, we can subtract. So all the natural operations that you usually do over a ring, over a field. Uh, of course, you can, you can extend this kind of discussion to some kind of non-commutative setting where the uh, multiplication from the left, from the right will be different. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to mostly talk about uh, systems of, of varieties or systems but of equations. Just, just a quick remark. And equal yeah. to three is also okay, yes, for, for Fermat's equation. Uh, sorry? And equal to three is yeah, also okay it for was meant to, to be uh, greater or equal. Well, actually, actually, I, I think I removed it because I was planning originally to to talk about the uh, exponent three special because Euler like separately uh, proved it, but it's, it's it's still the same family. So yes. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, all these polynomials that you find here are kind of special. So I leave you with this little exercise of finding on Wikipedia or in your own mind or with some textbooks that you have read, why they are special and for what reason they might be uh, significant here. So this polynomial of degree 10 is so far uh, the, the best in its class. And then please go check why, what's special about this one. And, and this one is also famous uh, because of the taxi cab numbers and of the story with Ramanujan and, and representing two numbers as two different, uh, two different, sum of two different cubes. So if you actually plug in this linear equation into this cubic, it will actually split. So you'll get uh, actually three rational solutions of out of these two that you know, the, the, the next one appears. And that's kind of a magic that we can play with that. Of course, the equations can be uh, typically, uh, we call them Diophantine equations. They can be also exponential. So exponential, I mean that you have x to power a, y to power b, and then this is the, firma, the, the famous uh, Catalan's conjecture proved by Mikhailescu uh, that, uh, that this equation essentially has only one non-trivial solution. Uh, that was quite a powerhouse at the time using modularity theorems and so on. But most of the time I'm going to talk about polynomial systems and polynomial equations. And it's already a lot of work uh, in that category. So feel free to, of course, explore something beyond that but just be warned that there are only dragons there. So we, we still 
have troubles with the familiar polynomials. And beyond that, it's getting even, even worse. Okay, so <clears throat> one important thing about equations is that, well, we, we get familiar, and that's maybe a kind of a pity in the, in the high school that uh, also in the primary school, that we get familiar with these kind of equations too early. And I'm not saying that this is bad to get acquainted with algebra when you're young, but if you, if you just get exposed through, through school to this kind of ideas, you somehow got very attached to how you look at the equations. And what I want to emphasize in this talk is actually that the fact that the equation, like we see it, like x times x plus y times y equals one, one here means the, the unit in the ring, uh, can be actually seen through the lens of different rings. And, and that's a very critical and important uh, observation, like you have seen in the, in the previous talk that you can, you can somehow uh, feel the object by looking at how it interacts with other objects. And that's exactly the, the point, that in this case, we want to somehow understand the equation. We, we don't understand the equation by itself, but we can measure and understand the equation by looking at how it looks like or how it can be solved in different rings. And, and let me give you some examples here. So over the integers, the familiar integers, 0, 1, minus 1, 2, and so on, well, it's not a difficult exercise uh, and kind of standard following from the axioms uh, that the complete set of, of integral solutions to the equation above is just uh, that set of, of four pairs, four Cartesian uh, products of two, of two elements. So, so this is it, okay? Over the integers, this is it. It's actually quite unusual that you can give so easily a complete list of integral solutions. Usually, if you think about an equation, even in one variable, that's not completely obvious, uh, and you, you're given the task, please list all the solutions or say that the set is infinite, well, that's a challenge worth a Fields Medal, okay? And that's exactly what Gerd Faltings got the Fields Medal for, that he showed that if you have an equation in two variables and as a topological object, it has this genus, the number of holes, bigger than one, then we know that the number of integral solutions is even rational solutions is essentially finite, okay? That, that's a very hard thing because even if I give you one equation of this kind, very simple coefficients, there is no finite algorithm that allows you to, to list all the solutions and be sure that you have already done all, okay? That, that's somehow the, the, the main mystery with integral and rational solutions that they are usually notoriously hard to find. And again, this so is really kind of exception. linked to this uh, Hilberton problem, yes, that this yes. is actually well, proven. Well, yes. the, the Hilberton's problem is actually much more bold because you're asking for a general algorithm that will actually get rid of the problem with all the uh, Diophantine equations. But with any single uh, Diophantine equation, we actually have a conditional algorithm that depends on the, on the, on the group of called SHA for, for, for Jacobians. It's quite a complicated story, but you can always think that for any given single equation, you have a conjectural algorithm that depends on some deep conjecture, which is called the birch on dyer conjecture. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a deep, deep fact uh, in arithmetic uh, geometry that you can reduce the question about the, uh, the, end, the, the stop condition for the algorithm to some kind of well-defined object in cohomologies, which if you can study properly, it will tell you whether you can stop or not. Okay, and, and that, that's, a, that's a separate story. So over the rational numbers, again, in this case, uh, we essentially rely on the trick that this quadratic equation, we can see it through the lens of geometry as a circle, right? So thanks René, René Descartes, who introduced this idea to us, that this equation fundamentally defines a circle. So if you have a circle and you know one point on the circle, you can just put a pencil of lines through that point. And that essentially allows you by slopes to parameterize this equation. That's exactly what this parameterization here is. So again, it's a, it's a kind of a very uh, interesting but very specific fact that works. By the way, if you're wondering if this generalizes, then if you have actually a very general equation of, uh, of arbitrary degree, and you're asking whether this kind of parameterization can happen, yes, it can happen if you have a point on this, on this curve 
that has sufficiently high multiplicity. And the multiplicity, if it's if the degree of the equation is let's say n, and the multiplicity of the points or the number of branches that meet at this point is n minus one, you can always parameterize it very easily. The, the non-trivial thing is that there are many actually curves, many, many uh, equations in two variables that can be also parameterized, but, th but they don't have this property. Like think about the, the bernoulli lemniz case, the famous uh, quartic equation that looks like, uh, like turn over eight. It actually can be parameterized with just lines in two steps, but it, it has only a singularity of degree two, while the equation is of degree four. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of, Geometric, uh, arithmetic, and, and other questions that we can ask about integers and rational numbers. But somehow I want you to, to so, so one take home message from this talk is that if you want to answer this kind of questions, you should actually go somewhere else. And, and my proposition, actually not mine, uh, just introduced by, by uh, very bright mathematicians over the centuries is that the, the most fundamental thing about studying equations is to move from the integers themselves, from the rational numbers themselves to real numbers. That's the first approximation to whether we can find an, a solution or not. So, so why is it important? Well, if you have an equation of this form, x squared plus y squared equals zero, and you ever wonder about whether this equation has any integral solutions, well, you just look at, the overset of real solutions, and you clearly see that there is just one, which is zero, zero, right? So already the integral set is embedded in that, hence you just have the solution set zero, zero. Even more, so, so real geometry is nice because we can see it, but it has one problem that is kind of essentially incomplete. Incomplete in the sense that the field that we talk about, the real numbers, are not algebraically closed, right? If you talk about x squared plus one equals zero, well, you get a problem with this equation because it doesn't have a solution, but kind of has a solution. And, and where it has a solution, we're over, over the algebraic closure of the real field, over the complex one. Of course, we can take a bigger algebraic closure. It doesn't matter for this, this, this talk, but let's keep just things simple, just the complex geometry. Complex geometry is also special because it induces some kind of extra geometric structure on the equation. So if you look now at the equation that we started from, from the point of view now of not the real geometry where you see a circle. Now, if you look from the point of view of the complex numbers, well, you actually get something that looks much nicer. It's a two dimensional, well, two dimensional in the sense of real numbers, uh, sphere with two points removed. Why the points are removed? Well, because we are not in the projective space. We have not completed our equation yet. Okay, so, so now uh, this point of view, so looking at the real solutions, looking at the complex solutions, introduces you to geometry, to complex analysis, to complex geometry, to, to uh, analytic ideas, and, and gives you some kind of feeling what ultimately might be possible with this equation. But there is one more aspect uh, to, to, to equations, which is fundamentally, I think, uh, as fruitful as the other approaches. It's intrinsically very important is that you want to look at the equation, especially if it has integral coefficient, as a, as a way of playing with the numbers over a finite field or over a finite ring. So in this case, what I'm saying is that if you look at this equation x squared plus y squared equals one, and you, you assume that x, y are just numbers modulo p, right? So you basically are studying a congruence. What's, What's really interesting about, about the, the, the properties of the equations intrinsically is that you can usually give some kind of nice formula for the number of points over a finite field. And this formula actually intrinsically encodes the topology and geometry of this scheme, of this variety. So we don't see it yet. This, this formula looks rather particular. But I claim that first of all, if you, if you projectivize, so you add these two missing points at infinity, it will turn out that actually the, the number of points you get for this projective, uh, projectivized version of the equation is actually P plus one. And what does P plus one tell you about this equation? It tells you essentially that this equation is encoding 
a projective line. A projective line over complex numbers is exactly the Riemann sphere that we have already seen. Over the real numbers is the circle, okay? And over a finite field is just an object which has one plus P points, okay? And, and now if you turn this idea upside down, it turns out that you can, you can attach to equations some kind of a barcode, some kind of a label built from real numbers, complex numbers, and finite fields that completely characterizes this equation. So now we get a new tool, which allows you to somehow think of an equation as some kind of a functor that reveals its properties through the interpretation of the points over certain rings. And, and the bold idea that the, the, this grand unification and this grand scheme of things is that we can essentially encode the equations through the point counts. And this little bit of topology and geometry that you, you get revealed from the complex realization and from the real realization. Okay, so that all looks very, still very, very foggy. So, sorry, I, I'm yes. a little bit confused since uh, you have P minus one over two, yeah? So, so what is, uh, what happens if uh, P is uh, uh, an even? Oh, great, great question. question. So if P is two, well, you, you get this uh, freshman's dream. So that equation actually turns into a double line. And you just get uh, this this line double, right? So if you if you move everything to the left, in characteristic two, everything is a plus. So you get this zero. So then you can remove the exponent, and you simply get a line which is doubled. So so a conic in characteristic two is a degenerate object. It's just a line taken twice. So sort of here, p is uh, an arbitrary integer or p the prime is, number? Uh, p is, uh, is always uh, here, it's a prime. A prime, okay. So when I write okay. p, I, I, I always mean a prime, okay. yes. Yeah, of, of course, over, over, over composite integers, uh, this will be much more complicated. We know how to co count it by Chinese reminder theorem. We can, we can easily do this kind of uh, counting, but it, the formulas are not more meaningful. So the point is that if we characterize the number of points uh, over integers modulo p where p are primes, that's enough to completely characterize the variety itself. Okay, so let's, let's have a look. So let's play a game of charades. I think all of you uh, know how to play it. In Polish, it's a, a kalambure, so quite a fun, fun thing to play. And, and what's the point of playing this game here? So, so first of all, we want to guess the equation just from the knowledge of its solutions over various rings. So this will be like real, real charades. You'll try to show the, uh, the idea of the object by doing some kind of auxiliary awkward moves. That's exactly what we do with the primes. Okay, uh, and, and how do we win? Well, the player wins. So there, there's a player and there's the oracle, which tells us something like yes or no. It's not exactly like a classical charade, uh, but the player wins uh, if she can trick the others that she is the oracle. Right, so once you learn, once you gain confidence and knowledge about this equation without actually knowing it, to answer all the questions like the oracle you want. And is it even possible? <clears throat> okay, so what are the rules? Well, we play only with polynomial equations. Well, we can play with whatever equations, but I don't know how to play this game in general. Uh, now, if the player says a prime number or prime power, the oracle will tell us just a number, like how many solutions there are modulo three and the oracle will tell you the number, okay? We can also ask some kind of extended questions like, like what is the list of primes for which the number of solutions is kind of special, okay? That will be like an extra question that we can ask. What else we can say? Well, we can also ask about some, rough geometry of the objects. Like, can you tell me the, the topological dimension of the set of solutions? For the circle, it would be like dimension one over reals or over complex numbers. Uh, can you tell me the, the covering degree? Like, is it an equation of degree two or degree five? We don't ask this kind of questions. Well, it's impossible to actually win this game. But the only thing that we don't ask and we don't want to ask is, can you tell me the set of integral or rational solutions? That's forbidden. Why it's forbidden? Because it's usually impossible. So even the oracle cannot say that, okay, in finite time. So, so we are only asking 
this kind of very simple question. And let me show you how this game works. So here's game one. So we are asking, okay, what is the complex dimension of this, of this equation that you talked about? And the oracle says zero, okay? So what are zero dimensional objects in, in uh, equations? Well, these are just unions of points. If it's a union of points, well, we can always turn it by Grubner basis construction by whatever ways you want. You can always find a representation in the ideal that leads to a single polynomial in one variable. Okay, so we already get from this part of the question that the game will be about equation, essentially about equation in one variable. What's the degree? The degree is two. Okay, so now that means that in our game, the Oracle is playing with us with an equation of degree two. Well, that's actually a, a quadratic polynomial. Okay, that, that's the only object that satisfies these two properties. Okay, so what do we know about quadratic polynomial? Well, if we don't know the coefficients, the only thing we know how to, uh, what, what, what we can do is that we can essentially transform our equation to this completed form, where on the right-hand side, we have this so-called discriminant, and on the left-hand side, we have a square. And now we are going to, to ask questions over finite fields to reveal what is exactly the value of this delta of this square, or of this, of this number b squared minus four ac. Well, one thing that we definitely don't hope to, to achieve is that we cannot extract from the game the actual number because the number is ambiguous up to squares. So the only thing we can really extract is the value of delta up to squares. That's exactly the point. Okay, so the oracle tells us that if you'll give me a prime number p, I will tell you, and that's again a property of this degree two equation, that it can have either zero, one, or two solutions modulo a prime number. Why is so? So when it can happen that you have exactly one solution for the quadratic equation modulo p? Can anyone tell me what has to happen with the delta? So I, I, it, these are all integers, right? I reduce modulo p, and when the equation x squared equals delta modulo p has exactly one solution. Zero, exactly. So that will mean exactly that p divides delta, right? That's the only possibility. Otherwise, you either have zero solutions or two solutions. And it's like with complex numbers, right? Now we are just pretending we are doing like, like complex numbers, but over finite fields. Okay, so this is our next question. This is this kind of overkill that without it, we'll have to actually do a lot of other stuff, like asking about size of the coefficients, doing some kind of uh, search. But basically, without this question, the game might be potentially infinite. You might be asking more and more questions, but you'll never know whether you got enough information. So with this question, tell me all primes for which there is one solution. Well, we get two and three. Okay, so here's our conjecture. So the delta, well, she notes a conjecture now, uh, even a claim, the delta up to a square, the common square, is plus minus, can be a minus, uh, two to power A, three to power B. A and B are just got, got rid of the, 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 the even powers. So up to a, a, a common square of 36 to power C, the A and B can be only zero and ones. And now I want to show you that we can already finish the game. So we remember, we want to become an oracle. Right? So the next time any other player is playing, we'll be effectively acting as an oracle with this node. And now what do we have to use in this case? So this case is very special because we have a quadratic equation and quadratic equations are miraculous for the following fact that the number of solutions modulo prime over a finite field for the quadratic equation can be nicely described by something called the Legendre symbol, which is basically uh, minus one to the power p minus one over two. Okay, and and uh, uh, sorry, uh, that that's for minus one. That's for that will be for delta. That like. And now, th this is a very classical theorem, going back to very classical number theory that. The symbol, which detects, so the symbol is zero, one, or minus one. It's zero when P is dividing the, this, this element delta, 
minus one if the delta is not a square modulo p, and it's a one if delta is a square modulo p. And, and the property that we use to win the game is this little fact that the symbol is actually multiplicative. So if you have not seen this fact, go and check like in Ireland Rosen or other textbook on number theory. It's a pretty beautiful theorem, which is very classical, very elementary, but it's, it's, it's an instance of something which we can even go, go to up to the level of Langland's program. It's some kind of reciprocity law. Okay, so how do we use it? Well, we use it in the following way. So tell me the value of delta over P. So tell me whether delta is a square for, for uh, 13, okay? And the oracle just does the calculation, solves its own intrinsic equation. We don't know what it does, but it tells us one, okay? So one means that actually X squared equals delta modulo 13 has two solutions. Okay, and what do we learn from this? Okay, so we know that minus one is actually a square modulo of 13. In fact, what is the square root of that? We also can check easily that two is not a square modulo of 13. So we get minus one. And we can check that three is actually a square modulo of 13. And now knowing that all these symbols are multiplicative, right, the property on the top, and knowing how our discriminant was looking like, so we are looking for the discriminant which was plus minus two to power a, three to power b times a square. A square is always over the symbol give the value of one, so they are irrelevant. Well, we deduce from this equation and from the application of the Legendre symbol, then minus one to power a has to be equal to one. But since the oracle told us that this number uh, is, is one, that's exactly the one here, we deduce that a, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, that's exactly correct, uh, that a has to be equal to zero. Okay, now the next question. Uh, now, how am, I, how am I choosing these primes? I don't know, I'm just checking the next one for which this is going to work. The deep fact is that there is always a simple finite even bounded in terms of delta collection of primes for which this is going to work. You can even predict the number of steps. If you have already guessed this shape, then it's an effective algorithm to tell you which primes you need to check for which, for which this will be revealed. Anyway, uh, so now the next question is, what is delta over P? What is the Legendre symbol for 17? And it's actually minus one. So the, the, the oracle is just simply telling us, no, there are no solution to the equation X squared equals delta modulo 17, okay? And it didn't tell us what are these solutions, it didn't tell us anything else. But now we can deduce exa exactly from the same game that since minus one over 17 is a one, since two over 17 is a one, and since three over 17 is a minus one, remember these are not fractions, it's just a symbol, okay? So three is not a square modulo 17, we deduce that minus one to power b is actually equal to minus one, hence b is equal to one, okay? So now we got the information that delta is actually plus minus three times a square. Now what's missing? Well, we just want to figure out whether it's a plus or a minus. What do we do? We, now we look for the prime where the information from the two and the three will be irrelevant. And the lowest prime for this is actually 23. So when I was preparing this slide yesterday, I basically just browsed to the primes and found the, the smallest ones, which are called. And the oracle tells us minus one. So that means that modulo 23, this equation has no solutions. Okay, so again, from the same game, we learned that now delta is exactly minus three times the square. And now it's a win. Why it's a win? Because first of all, the, the player from the fact that delta is negative real number can deduce that there are no real solutions to this equation. Hence, there are also no rational and no integral solutions. So now look at this story from the following perspective. Just from the knowledge of primes, we have discovered this, the structure of the integral solutions to this equation, okay? And that's a very strange fact, like why, why anyone would expect that from the knowledge of primes, you'll be able to completely characterize the integral solution. So that, that's an instance of some, something called the local global principle. For quadratic equations, it's completely effective. That was proved by, by Helmut Hasse in the 19th century. 
that essentially if you have any quadratic form in any number of variables, if you want to figure out whether it has a rational solution or not, in, in, in classical binary forms, that's a theorem of Legendre, uh, you can ask this kind of questions and you'll always get the answer effectively, okay? So that's why it's called the local global principle that the local information, the information about the solutions for primes or for periodic numbers, that's just a more fancy way of, of studying systems of congruences. Uh, we learn global information about integral solutions, about rational solutions. Sorry, how you think about these questions about real numbers? These are also local? In infinity. Of course, they are definitely local. Yes, yes, in they are local. Yes, yes. That, that's this infinite part. And it's also quite so in, in many situations, the first thing you ask will be about this infinite places like real numbers, complex numbers. Of course, complex numbers are not very meaningful because there is always a solution. But there is a tiny chance for quadratic form that it actually has no real solutions, right? If the oracle will tell you this, then you know that there are no integral solutions. Notice that, however, with this infinite places, what we cannot learn is how to become an oracle yet, right? So, so the infinite place is good, for example, sometimes to approximate integral solutions, but it's not enough to win the game in the sense of effectively replacing the oracle in answering this kind of questions, right? Real numbers are not enough. But it turns out that the real numbers and the primes are completely enough, and, and what's even more surprising is that we just need finitely many primes. In general, it's actually not so easy. That was your original question, that if you have sufficiently complicated equation, we still don't know whether there is a way to make this kind of game effective. So we don't know the stop condition. I mean, conjecturally, we know what to look at, but we don't know whether these objects are finite or not. Okay, so uh, now, how do we become an oracle? Well, we have to now use something called the Gauss reciprocity. The Gauss reciprocity tells you that, okay, if you know that the symbol three over P and you multiply it by P over three, then you get some number which is completely explicit. It's just minus one to power three minus one over two times P minus one over two. That's a quadratic reciprocity law uh, for this symbol. But that's kind of a miracle. Actually, to understand why this is true, you have to go deeper. I mean, you have elementary proofs of this theorem, but deeply, it's a property of the Galois groups of some number of things. It's, a, it's quite a deep fact. And in a sense, what Langlands in his program said, that this is an incarnation of some big, big conjecture called the, the reciprocity conjecture. But what it tells us now on the ground is that delta over P is actually the symbol P over three. So now if you want to become an oracle to, to give the answer to how many solutions you have modular prime, you just have to understand the meaning of this symbol. And it's very simple because if it's P, mo P over three, that means that essentially the class modulo three of the prime number matter. And of course, P modulo, uh, P congruent to one modulo three is a square because one is a square. And modulo three, two is not a square. So if your player will give you now a number which is congruent to two modulo three, you say uh, to them minus one. If they give you a prime number which is congruent to one modulo three, you say one and you became an oracle. You cannot be distinguished from the oracle, okay? Okay, that's, that's the end of the game. So we, we, we won it. Now we completely characterize the equation without seeing that. Okay, what we have not gained from the game is the actual equation. But as I'm going to show you, it's not the equations that are important. What is important are these kind of functorial properties that these objects can, can encode. Of course, if, if someone is really asking for the equation, this is not the tools uh, that you need. You need more, but you can still do it, okay? And of course, to get the actual equation, you will have to go to some ugly methods like computations, like really hard computation. Okay, so this is the end of the game. But now I want to tell you that this game is exactly the fundamental idea 
about the grand unification. So, so we want the following things to be true. We don't know yet. It took whiles like 10 years to prove it just for elliptic curves, but we want the following idea. So we start from a variety, from a system of equations, and we want to hook up an object. And this object can be incarnated in different categories in different ways. It will be essentially called a motive, but for now it's just a bunch of numbers that we package these numbers into something called an L function. I'm going to show you in a moment what is the L function. And we pretend that this L function is like a barcode. So if you have two objects that are intrinsically different, the barcodes will be different. If the objects are kind of identified like the quadratic equations with the same discriminant, then the barcode will be essentially identical, okay? And most of this, unfortunately, but fortunately for you, because there is plenty of work to be done, is completely open. So we know how to play in the games, the rules of this game. We know how to attach the objects, but what we are not sure is that whether it actually works, whether if you are given two barcodes and they are the same, whether they, are, they can actually come from different objects. Okay, what are the possible barcodes? How we classify the barcodes in simple terms, because it turns out that these L functions, these barcodes can be decomposed like, like integers into atoms, into primes. So Robert Langlatz in his bold conjecture, bold, bold, bold web of conjectures, claims that if we use a very particular object, which is an L function, from the so-called Zilber class is just a label telling us that the object will have some specific analytic properties that then this identification will ultimately identify the objects uh, that we need. Okay, so let me now explore more of this idea. So you all are very familiar with this object because you all know the Riemann zeta function it's exactly one example of the L function. It's actually the simplest L function because it's just essentially encoding a point. But as you know, the Riemann, the Riemann hypothesis is still open and it's open for a single point. So how much more complicated are higher dimensional varieties if the point is so complicated? But basically the object that we want to attach to any variety is just a sequence of numbers. We call them AN coefficients. And we package it into a function, which is, has some nice properties, like it's a holomorphic, it satisfies some functional equation. But what's important is that this L function, this equation will uniquely, presumably, uniquely identify the objects to which it's attached. And I want to spend the, the rest of the talk by showing you examples where this actually works. And the grand scheme of things is that we hope that all the objects have this property. Okay, I don't have much time. There will be a separate talk by Professor Kartorowski where you explore some of the ideas behind the Riemann zeta function, like its Euler product, its functional equation, uh, its, its special values. All of this is very important and it's actually very critical to the theory that I want to discuss. But for now, just think that this object has a lot of hidden information that if you manage to somehow take charge of the prime numbers of the prime counting, you put all of these things into a product, you get a, this, this nice holomorphic function, suddenly you gain some extra knowledge. And this extra knowledge is exactly the, the, the incarnation of, of this arrow being reversed. So once you know how to operate with the L function, you get this kind of God power of manipulating the varieties on a very powerful level. And uh, as I said, the ultimate goal is to show that all the L functions, all these barcodes that we attach to the varieties, they come from the something called the Zellberg class. And we strongly believe that all these L functions are some kind of, by some kind of strange coincidence, which we don't understand yet, exactly the same objects as we get in the theory of automorphic forms. What is the theory of automorphic forms? It's just a far-fetched generalization of the representation theory of finite groups. 
just two infinite, infinite groups. That's all it is. But the nice thing about this, this point of view is that we can attach to this computable L function, which counts the cardinalities of the point sets over prime numbers, some kind of object that is essentially analytic. Okay, and that's exactly what, uh, what uh, Andrew Wiles has achieved by proving the modularity theorem that he has matched the L function of the elliptic curve with the L function of the automorphic form of GL2 type. That's all it does. It took him like 10 years and it took other people 40 years to even get to that level. It's like something like 20,000 pages of, 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 uh, of text if you want to read from the really beginning to the end of the proof. It's a lot of work, but it proves something really significant that the barcode for elliptic curves essentially characterizes them. That means in particular that if you have an oracle spitting the numbers for you, at some point, if you, if you learn, for example, the conductor of the elliptic curve, which is just something like about the size of the elliptic curve, and the oracle tells you the number A1, A2, and, and so on, at some point you say stop, and you say, now I know what is your elliptic curve. I can reconstruct the equation of your elliptic curve just from these numbers. So the barcode becomes a variety. Okay, I'm not going to again discuss the properties of the Zellberg class, but you can think of this that if you do this exercise for the Riemann zeta function, it satisfies all these properties. Now, one thing which I find uh, pretty amusing about the Zellberg class and uh, quite typical about mathematics is that once we get acquainted with the objects that we understand and see, we kind of pretend that there are no other objects. And sometimes it's, it's completely a bad idea because there are plenty of things out there. Like look at physicists. Every time they assume that they got enough particles, there's another one showing up. But unfortunately or fortunately in mathematics, in many times it's kind of economic thinking that if I don't know how to play the, the rules of the games in other ways, there are probably no other ways. And the, the grand scheme of things is that we want to believe that there is nothing else. Of course, it would be super exciting to discover that maybe there is something else, but that will completely destroy the picture of the barcode, and we hope not. Okay, so again, the information that is being encoded in the L function is rather subtle, but what's interesting is that if you gain the equation or you characterize these L functions by its global properties, like the conductor, like the gamma factors, many times you can actually discover what kind of variety you should be expecting, what kind of a motive you should be expecting. And there are plenty of types. So if you go to the website called LMFDB, which I definitely recommend, lfunctionsmodularformsdatabase.org, you can explore with your bare hands, with your bare minds, the beauty of L functions. You can really take the L function, look at its coefficients, see what it comes from, what objects are connected to and whether they are, they are somehow related. Very nice. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? Eight minutes. Wow, okay, that's, that's rather small amount. So let me show you now the progression, how to get to this final thing, which is called the motive. I think th this picture really nicely shows us the, the, the whole idea. So, so we are talking about L functions, remember barcodes for varieties, but we are actually talking about several objects. So on one hand side, we have something mysterious, which is just categorical, very pure, but very difficult to work with. It's, it's called a motive. Motive means basically that like, for example, if you have a projective line, projective line decomposes into a point and an affine line. And these are two fundamental motives, the, the point, and the line. And just telling this that you have point and a line, it's exactly the same over finite field to saying that the number of points on the projective line is one plus P. P is the number of points on the line. One is the number of points on the point. Okay, and in this language of numbers, you, you can talk with each other on the level of motives. On the other hand side, you have Galois representations. This has to do with how we can deal with motives on the level of arithmetic. When we pass to etal cohomology, 
we can build up Galois representations and Galois representations tell us something about how the point counts can be organized into meaningful chunks. So for example, if you, if you encounter in, in your point, point, point count on the variety, some kind of a weird twiggle of the numbers, it turns out that usually it's a trace of a matrix. And this matrix is coming from the representation of the Galois group, but ultimately it's just algebra. And there's even more part to this. And remember that all these connections are meaningful. There's the world of automorphic forms, which is really scary. And it's essentially it's analysis on the, on the compact periodic local groups and so on, a lot of things. But the, the beauty of this part is that the L functions that we get from the automorphic world are just perfect. And remember the claim, we want to pretend that all the L functions that are in the real world for varieties are coming from automorphic world. And remember that Wiles proved it just for a single instance for the elliptic curve. Okay, a little interlude, maybe I'll skip it. Uh, I'll just, just storm through these five slides just to whet your appetite. So what we can do with all these ideas, just, just a glimpse of, of what we can apply it for. So the famous proof of irrationality of Zeta three by Aperi uses some strange numbers, rational numbers, and some of them even integers that satisfy a weird congruence that it's even impossible that, that it happens to have these properties that it's so integral. And the, the, the goal is that the, limit of this quotient of these two numbers tends to zeta of three. And now if you look at the properties of these numbers, they turn out to actually prove by standard diophantine approximation method that indeed zeta of three is irrational. Where, where do you come from when you want to see this kind of equation? Where this congruence com is coming from? Where, where this, uh, sorry, this recurrence is coming from? Well, it turns out that there is a deep connection to the integrals over uh, two forms on a K3 surface. And that's something to add your appetite. And it, essentially it's a motive. So these are called periods? Yes. yes. The, the, this is a special incarnation of the period. So zeta of three is a period of a certain K3 surface. Another very strange connection. So you start with the equation like this, implicit equation, and we love to compute integrals, right? Everyone loves to compute integrals, especially when you cannot integrate it by finite terms, because you know that you can treat it as an object in itself. You don't need to find the answer, right? You, you look at the Liouville theorem, you find out this is not integral in, in the classical elementary terms. So good luck, what do we do with this function? Well, it turns out it's actually meromorphic, even holomorphic. And now with a little bit of game, we find out that it satisfies a linear order two differential equation, ordinary differential equation with rational coefficients. Now we turn everything upside down. We solve this equation from the fundamental solution at zero. And it turns out that actually our cherished integral is just a power series multiplied by pi. Where the pi is coming from, that's a twist by Tate motive. I'm not going to talk about it. Anyway, what's really interesting now is that we know that this integral can be actually expanded as a power series with essentially very simple rational coefficients. But that's not all. So remember, geometry, now differential uh, equations, topology and arithmetic are the same thing. That's what we claim. So here's the result. Well, this is elementary. If you look at this Hochhammer symbols, modulo P, for n bigger than p plus one over two, it's always congruent to zero. Just go and check. But now what's very surprising is the number of points on this implicit equation, on this elliptic curve, modulo p is actually given by this power series taken literally over a finite field. That doesn't make any sense, but it does. And eventually we correct it. So it, this was just a congruence. Now we have a quality. So it turns out that actually the number of points on the elliptic curve plus the point at infinity is P plus one. This is coming from the second cohomology. This is coming from the zero cohomology. 
And this is the real, the real gam. It's the motive of the elliptic curve. So now what is this motive? It's actually some kind of finite field incarnation of the power series that was attached intrinsically to the integral. Very weird. But I claim, not me myself that came up with it, I just read it somewhere, that this really works in general, okay? Now, there's another thing to whet your appetite. If you take this ratio of factorials, it's integral, go and check. If you manage to prove it, you're very good. Now, what you might not be able to prove is that actually if you pack it into power series, this power series is algebraic. It means it satisfies a polynomial equation. That's really quick. And actually, if you try it for different numbers, then I'll tell you that essentially all numbers other from this one, except for finitely many exceptions, will give you non-integral numbers and will not satisfy algebraicity. Again, very weird. And the last bit is about physics. So you start with the power series, which is hypergeometric. You know, it satisfies a nice differential equation. And this differential equation, if you, if you rub it a little bit, you get a different form. And now suddenly this differential equation is expressing numbers in the Lambert series. These are called the MD numbers, so-called instanton numbers. They are integers. Actually, Masha Vlasenko recently proved with, with uh, Fritz Boykers that this is a general phenomenon, which we can even prove elementary. But these numbers count some objects. What they count? Well, they actually count some curves on a general quintic. Where, where, where is the quintic? We started from a differential equation. Well, it turns out that you can, in a meaningful way, attach to a variation of varieties, a differential equation. And remember, every equation gives an L function, so we have a variation of L function. And all of this comes up with a differential equation. Very weird. Okay, so let me finish with some general idea to, to take from here. That if you have a family of varieties, not a single one, but a family of varieties, they come with these strange holomorphic functions, which are basically the integration of the cycles and the homology against differential forms. I know it sounds a little bit fancy, but it's just, just a stupid integration. And what I claim is that all these functions satisfy nice differential equations. And these differential equations somehow control not only the geometry, but also the arithmetic in every single case. And how do you think, how many cases we know for which this works? Well, basically less than 10, but we still pretend that it should be this grand scheme. And uh, well, I have plenty of slides to, to talk about, but I think it's a, it's a good point. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for this beautiful talk. Do we have any questions from, maybe we'll start with on-site participants. Uh, may, maybe I would like to ask one question. You, yeah. you mentioned that the Riemann hypothesis is somehow related to uh, to a point. Yes. I, I heard some idea about some mysterious object which is called filled with one element. It oh, yeah, yeah. Not that, that, uh, uh, used to be understood directly, uh, but but it's conjectural. So could you say something about it? Yeah, so so the, the, this is the, uh, again, like a deeper understanding of, of so so basically the, 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 the idea is that uh, when we start with a variety, we typically call about the, the we take, talk about the system of equations over a field, okay? But there is nothing bad about looking at the variety over, over the spectrum of the integers, right? So basically like looking at all this realization over primes. And, and already the object, the spectrum of the integers, so all the prime, prime ideals is not entirely primitive, right? And the, the idea, the main idea is that we want to somehow build up a, a bigger theory in which the spectrum of the integers will be already an object like the variety of fields 
we want to find out some object that effectively will work that the spectrum is like a, an object over this field with one element. Of course, it's not a field with one element because there is no such object, but functorially, we can model the properties of such category in which this makes sense and try to witness it. And that's the, the big program of Alan Kohn and also of the belated uh, Yuri Mangin that they were trying to find this kind of, uh, this kind of idea working. What's very interesting is that if you, if you take this perspective, then many things that you find in representation theory becomes actually much more natural. So, so you can somehow think that the, 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 the real source, the, the real initial object in some kind of strange category is not the spectrum of the integers, but it's rather this, this mysterious uh, field with one element. But, but that's a completely speculative thing. So we, we don't have this category and, and we can only speculate how it would look like to make sense. But so far we just have not found, a, well, we found some candidates like, like the, the, the sphere spectrum, but it's, it's not entirely obvious how to use these things for practical computations. So we are definitely not even close, at least we have not seen a proof, to Riemann hypothesis uh, proof with this kind of approach than we have seen with other approaches as well. Uh, these other approaches, uh, uh, you, you mean uh, this uh, Riemann hypothesis for uh, rational, uh, fields of rational okay, functions? Yeah, yes? I had a slide for that, but I didn't have time to, to get that far. Uh, so, so if you look at the, the zeta function, uh, you have this, this, uh, this famous uh, theorem, uh, which is attributed to many people, including uh, Artin, Weil, Hasse, Schmidt, Grotendieck, and finally Delin, uh, which basically tells you that, I mean, it's, it's a really simple theorem. That's what I want to say. I mean, it looks scary, but it's, it's really that simple. And it just tells you that if you count the number of points over a finite field, modulo p, but also modulo higher fields. And remember that modulo p squared is not a field, right? You have to take a field with p squared element, but it's a different ring. But nevertheless, if you count the number of points in the system for all the finite fields, fp, fp squared, and so on, you get a sequence of integers, right? Basically even positive integers. You put it into a function, okay? That's a little bit technical, but not difficult to figure out that you cannot just take a generating function like you know, you take the exponential generating function. Why you take an exponential generating function? Because the sequence, when you look at this graph is obviously exponential, okay? So there is nothing else to do, just pack it into exponential uh, generating function. And now the miracle that was proved by Dvork is that actually this is not a, formal power series with rational coefficients, it's actually a rational function, which is a quotient of basically two polynomials. Okay, and now what this tells us, this tells us that, again, it's kind of an oracle game, that if you give me uh, some information about this, this, this function, like you tell me what these polynomials are, I can tell you the property of the sequence if I just get, enough terms because they basically satisfy a recurrence like Fibonacci number. That's exactly the same idea, okay? And, and now what, what, what this uh, theorem of Delin, eventually Delin is telling us is that this function factorizes in a very specific way. So it's not only that it's a quotient of two integral polynomials, but these polynomials actually factor with respect to weights and these weights correspond to cohomology groups, again, to some kind of motifs. And basically this is just enough to say that they have roots of fixed norm. And, and that's all this theorem is telling us. And now notice that this norm is quite important because now if you take this literally, it's a finite field version of the Riemann hypothesis. Of course, remember that despite the fact that all the roots are lying on the right line uh, in the sense of norm, they, if you package all this together, you multiply all these terms together, multiply all these local zeta functions, you get an L function like the, the, the Riemann zeta function, but you don't know nothing about its, its, its roots, 
okay? It's zeros. So th there is something that we fundamentally don't understand about this process of passing from varieties to all functions is that we know what happens on the local level. We know how these things encode properties of the varieties, but somehow the properties of the zeros of the Riemann zeta functions and of this, all these analogs of the Riemann zeta functions are telling us something more that we don't know what it is yet. That, that's, I think, the, the, the biggest mystery in this grand scheme of things. And I think once we learn what the Riemann zeta function zeros really mean, and not just some kind of funny interpretation like the, 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 the best counting number for the prime numbers, but really what important object they encode, we will get a bigger scheme. We'll probably get another category in which everything will somehow close up. Maybe this is the ultimate goal, but so far we don't know. So we don't know for Riemann zeta function, definitely we don't know for any other L function that this is true. Okay, thank you. So more questions? And let me see if there is some question on the Zoom. I don't see any raised hands. So if it is, sorry. So we ran out of time. So I have a question. Did you give uh, this talk uh, some other time so we can find it online? Oh, I can share the slides with you. It's, um, I'm happy to do so. So yeah. I'm also going to stay for, for the whole afternoon. So feel free to, to just store me with how many questions you have. Um, yeah, but uh, recording, uh, I can't find recording. Uh, you mean of this particular talk? No, uh, this talk uh, is no. being recorded. Yes. Now. About, um, um, and I the mean, slides would be available yeah. on the website. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, a recording of entire lecture, uh, which uh, didn't happen. Oh, no, th this lecture never happened like in this form. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a unique experience. <laughs> okay. You can so also judge it by the number of slides. <laughs> If there are no more questions, so that's our thank our speaker again. Okay. Uh, disconnect from the.